Lily leaves Mrs. Hatch and again cast about for occupation. Gertie and Carrie Fisher try to establish her with a charming millinery shop, but find that her fashionable friends will not support her. So Lily goes into the workroom of Madame Regina. Look at those spangles, Miss Bart. Every one of them sewed on crooked. The tall forewoman dropped the condemned structure of wiring net on the table at Lily's side. There were 20 of them in the workroom, their fagged profiles <coughs> bowed in the harsh north light. Their faces were sallow. In the whole workroom, there was only one skin beneath which the blood visibly played, and that now burned with vexation as Miss Bart, under that lash of the forewoman's comment, began to strip the hat frame of its overlapping spangles. Lily had taken up her work in early January. It was now two months later, and she was still being rebuked for in her inability to sew spangles on a hat frame. As she returned to her work, she heard a titter pass down the tables. She knew she was an object of amusement to the other workwomen. They were, of course, aware of her history. The exact situation of every girl in the room was freely discussed by all the others. But the knowledge did not produce in them any awkward sense of class distinction. It merely explained why her untutored fingers were still blundering. Lily had no desire that they should recognize any social difference in her. But she had hoped to be received as their equal, and perhaps before long to show herself their superior by a special deafness of touch. And it was humiliating to find that after two months of drudgery, she still betrayed her lack of early training. Remote was the day when she might aspire to exercise the talents she felt confident of possessing. Only experienced workers were entrusted with the delicate art of shaping and trimming the hat and the forewoman still held her inexorably to the routine of preparatory work. She began to rip the spangles from the frame. The air was closer than usual because Miss Haynes, who had a cold, had not allowed a window to be opened even during the noon recess. And Lily's head was so heavy with the weight of a sleepless night that the chatter of her companions had the incoherence of a dream. Mrs. Trammer's hat? The one with the green paradise? Here, Miss Haynes, it'll be ready right off. That was one of the Tremor girls here yesterday with Mrs. George Dorset. She's tall and slight with her hair frizzed out. On and on it flowed, a current of meaningless sound on which, startlingly enough, a familiar name now and then floated to the surface. It was the strangest part of Lily's strange experience, the hearing of these names, the seeing of the fragmentary and distorted image of the world she had lived in reflected in the mirror of the working girls' minds. Miss Bart, if you can't sew those spangles on more regular, I guess you better give that hat to Miss Gilroy. Lily looked down ruefully at her handiwork. The poor woman was right. The sewing was inexcusably bad. What made her so much more clumsy than usual was it a growing distaste for her task, her actual physical disability. She felt tired and confused. It was an effort to put her thoughts together. She rose and handed the hat to Miss Kilroy, who took it with a suppressed smile. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I'm not well, she said to the forewoman. You'd better go back to binding edges, she said dryly. Lily slipped out last among the band of liberated work women and struck westward through the dreary March twilight toward the street where her boarding house stood. The day's task done, she dreaded to return to her narrow room with its blotched wallpaper and shabby paint, and she hated every step of the walk thither through the degradation of a New York street in the last stages of decline from fashion to commerce. But what she dreaded most of all was having to pass the chemists at the corner of Sixth Avenue. She had meant to take another street, but her steps were irresistibly drawn toward the flaring plate glass corner. Over the counter, she caught the eye of the clerk, who had waited on her before, and slipped the prescription into his hand. There could be no question about the prescription. It was a copy of one of Mrs. Hatch's, obligingly furnished by that lady's chemist. The clerk had read the prescription without comment, but in the act of handing out the bottle, he paused. You don't want to increase the dose, you know, he remarked. Lily's heart contracted. What did he mean by looking at her in that way? Of course not, she murmured, holding out her hand. It's a queer acting drug. A drop or two more and off you go. The doctors don't know why. The dread lest he should question her or keep the bottle back choked her murmur of acquiescence. And when at length she emerged safely, she was almost dizzy with her. The mere touch of the packet thrilled her tired nerves with the delicious promise of a night of sleep. And in the reaction from her momentary fear, she felt as if the first fumes of drowsiness were already stealing over her. 
In her confusion, she stumbled against a man who was hurrying down the last steps of the elevated station. He drew back, and she heard her name uttered. She heard her name uttered with surprise. It was Rosedale, fur-coated, glossy, and prosperous. But why did she seem to him so far off, and as if through a mist of splintered crystals? Before she could account for the phenomenon, she found herself shaking her hands with him. They had parted with scorn on her side and anger on his, but all trace of those emotions seemed to vanish as their hands met, and she was only aware of a confused wish that she might continue to hold fast to him.